Stad al Ulama, Sayyid al Sharif Alim Ashraf stands, I stand. It's only adab that we follow and respect our senior Majayikh and Ulama. I cannot sit when he stands. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Was salatu was salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin, Sayyidil Awaleen wal Akhirin. وعلى آله وأزواجه وأصحابه أجمعين ورضي الله عن تابعيهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وعنا معهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين أما بعد فالسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته عليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته إن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم. So I'd always like to start with the book of Allah سبحانه وتعالى not only تبركا but also because the book كتاب الله تعالى as سيدنا عبد الله بن العباس حبر الأمة وبحرها رضي الله تعالى عنهما used to always say كتاب الله لا تنقضي عجائبه The book of Allah سبحانه وتعالى Keep giving wonders and wonders and wonders سبحان الله سبحان الله يقول ربنا عز وجل بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا قد كرمنا بني آدم وحملناهم في البر والبحر ورزقناهم من الطيبات وفضلناهم على كثير ممن خلقنا تفضيلا This ayah means in general this verse in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means in general وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي أَدَمْ which means Allah is telling us which means we have honored the offspring of Adam all all offspring of Adam. We have honored the offspring of Adam. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا كَرَّمْنَا means we've given takreem to the offspring of Adam. وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ We've given them all rizq. Yani if you behave, Allah gives you rizq. If you don't behave, Allah still gives you rizq and sustenance. <laughs> And your rizq is not taken away because you don't behave. As long as you live, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Creator, willed for you to continue living, He will continue providing you sustenance and provision. So this is mawsula bil adamiyya. This has to do because simply you are Adam, you are the children of Adam, the father of all humanity. So when Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَا وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ And then Allah says, وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا And we have given them tafdil. يعني tafdil means we favored them. We favored the children of Adam. يعني we favored the human beings. Over many things that we have created, the meaning of the ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created many things, but He favored the children of Adam over many things that He subhanahu wa ta'ala created. Now, what I am trying, the point I'm trying to drive here is very simple. Al Unsur al Adami, Al Unsur al Insani, the human as a human entity is honored in the book of Allah regardless of background just because you are the child of Adam Al-Quran Al-Kareem affirmed dignity worth and honor to every single human being by virtue of being a human being simply irrespective of background uh, ethnicities, creeds, cultures, etc. As if the, what, what, what I'm trying to say is, as if the Quran is telling us, we may be different colors, different backgrounds, different ethnicities, different creeds, but at the end of the day, we are one people. Kullukum li Adam wa Adamu 
I mean, to Arab. All of you are from Adam. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam. What kind of takrim? How did Allah honor the children of Adam? Well, number one, by creating everything for them. وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ Look at Al-Quran Al-Kareem. Allah says, وَسَخَّرَ لَكُمْ huh? جَعَلَ لَكُمْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ What does that mean? سَخَّر means He made things for you. خَلَقَ لَكُمْ He created things for you. جَعَلَ لَكُمْ He made things for you. The whole universe or the earth, planet earth that we're living on, the creator subhanahu wa ta'ala made it for you. Not to, for you to use, not to abuse. Hmm? Because Allah put a, put, he put a condition in it. استعمركم فيها He asked you to contribute to it, not to destroy it. He asked you to leave it as a better place than when you came into it. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us in the Quran al-Karim, said, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا In the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have an example, the best of examples, right? What, what is the example about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam here? Subhanahu. And Nabiul Karim sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa azwajihi wa sahbihi wa sallam came over 1400 some years ago to a place that used to be called the Arabian Peninsula. Today it's nine countries. Back then it was the Arabian Peninsula, but mind you, it was probably more than nine countries because it was ruled by tribes. Tribes, Qaba'il, used to rule wherever they rule. And the way at that time, the way things used to go, because the desert doesn't have industry, nor does it have agriculture. A desert, there's no agricultural thing in a desert. You got to have green and you got to have trees and you got to have water, obviously. And desert and water don't usually come together. So a place where there was no industry, obviously, 1,500 years ago or so, and there is no greenery, that means there's no water. The Qur'an speaks of that. أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْءٍ Mecca, there's no zarr. All right. So how did the tribes used to live? Well, business, trading, but not only. Violence. That's right. They used to live off of violence as well. In other words, violence which was based on a simple rule, might makes right. If I can, then I will do. Simply because I can. So a big tribe would wage war on a smaller tribe, conquer everything they have, and declare victory take land, confiscate property and, and herds and sheep and cattle and even human beings. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam emerged in a situation or in an environment where the Arabian Peninsula entirely with all its tribes was locked for decades in wars and violence and counter-violence, violence and counter-violence. They would fight over a line of poetry for years. You said the wrong thing to me. No, you said the wrong thing to me. It was the law of jungle because might makes right. That's the law of jungle. But we all know that our Prophet وسلم, and all the prophets that Allah sent they came with something very significant. It's the power of logic, not the logic of power. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give the prophets nuclear weapons to kill those who did not believe in them. 
or their message. But the logic of power was overpowering to those who have sound minds. Ya Nuhu qad jadaltana fa akfarta judalana. Wala in sa'ilta wa sa'ilta wa man khalaq as-sawab wa la arda yakun Allah. Fa anna yu'afakun. There's no, huh? there's no argument. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِلَّتِ هِيَ أَحْسَنٌ That's the quwa of the mantiq. That's the power of logic. Not the logic of power. It's difficult when we live in a situation where might equals right. Al-Qur'an Karim did not, want to, did not want us to stoop to levels of lower forms of human, of low, lower forms of life. That's why Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam." This takrim or honoring of the children of Adam means that you rise up to that level where you become the representative of the Creator on this earth. Not that you stoop down to a level where you act based on animalistic desires. There has to be a change. Today we hear about, yesterday we heard about that tragedy of 140 some school children. غير مكلفين even يعني someone who is not even شرعا يعني is not even an accountable person what are you doing and the days before a few days before about the tragedies in Sydney Australia and 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 Islam came to give life to people, even those who don't believe in it. And Islam did not come to take life away from people. And Islam came to give people three things, regardless whether they believe or don't believe in it. Came to give them hope, growth, and opportunity. Subhanallah. Hey, if you believe, great. If you don't believe, still you have hope. Still there's growth. Still there's opportunity. And still the Prophet ﷺ remains continuously ongoing all the time as a source of unconditional compassion unto you. By the definition of the mission statement, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ it's a verse in the book where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, puts the mission statement for the Prophet sallallahu whole message. What is your mission statement, Ya Rasulullah? We have sent you, but as unconditional compassion to the creation. Rahma here means unconditional. Huh? Unconditional compassion to the creation. But it's difficult when we live, when we try to uh, live in a world of jungle and follow the rules of jungle. And Islam came to bring people up intellectually and spiritually, bring them up to heavens, not let them go down to asfala safilin, to the lowest of lowest. No, Islam wants you to rise intellectually and spiritually. That's why Allah says, وَلَقَدِ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam." We've given takrim. We've honored the children of Adam. How did He honor them? Enough that He equipped them. He, number one, He gave them sakhra. He gave them all these things for them. Earth for you, all these things for you. He gave you everything. Even if you disobey Him, He still gives you. Isn't that honoring you? All right, how else did he honor you? By giving you the freedom of choice. 
Hmm? Let me now borrow the Maturidi line versus the Ash'ari line. Yeah, you have a choice in doing what you do. Obviously, your choice is created and you are created. But you have a choice. You can smile to people or you can frown to people. Your choice. What are you going to do? That's why you're accountable. Taklif comes because of this. Giving you a choice, isn't that honoring you and trusting you? Or let me say honoring you. I don't want to say trusting you. The creator knows you. He's your creator. But on a creation level, when someone gives you a choice, isn't that respecting you? Isn't that honoring you? You have a choice. Here you go. I'm equipping you with the power to obey and the power to disobey. No. He honored us as a creation with more. What? See, the human being is a complex compound in a sense. Part of you is clay. Huh? You are clay. Because the human being comes from clay. Clay is what? Sample of earth. You belong to earth. All of us belong to earth. And if you sample earth, the soil, if you sample the soil and you sample your blood, you'll find the ingredients in your blood right in the soil. Potassium, calcium, right. iron, you got them there. You're just a walking earth, but there's something different about you also. Allah says, فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَجِدِينَ Now this human being, the meaning of the ayah, when this human being is created, the very first human being, and Allah says, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ And I decreed the ruh, the soul, into this clay. Now first it's clay. But see, clay does not move by itself. There is a Rabbani order of a soul to be in this clay. So, there is something earthly in you, which is the clay. And there is something heavenly in you, which is the soul. And therefore, if you succumb to your clay, you might go down all the way. And if you rise to your soul, you'll go up all the way. That's the sir in where Allah says, فَقَعُوا فَإِذَا سَوَيْتُ سَوَيْتُ خَلَقْتُ سَوَيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ Not only tasweeya, not when, I, when, when, when Adam is created completely. No, no, no. وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ Once I decree that the soul, which is مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّكَ يَسَلُونَكَ يَسَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُوحِ قُلِ الرُوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّكَ وَمَا أُتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Ruh, the soul, is, uh, the soul is something only Allah knows. We don't know what the soul is. But it's something heavenly, huh? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like something very, very transparent. Something very beautiful. Something that sometimes tries to tell you, you know, don't do this, this is the wrong way. Huh? This is the wrong thing. But then your intellect, your aql starts now becoming the hijab. No, 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 let me intellectualize and rationalize this. No, 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 right? No. That's why the Sufis, they call this sir. Yeah, you hear qaddas allahu sirrahu, right? Sir. This is the secret in the human being. And this is the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adafaha ila nafsihi tashrifana. لا تجزيئا وتجزئة والعياذ بالله الله سبحانه وتعالى is not subject to that لكن ونفخت فيه من روحي once I'm finished with the creation of Adam in a way that's suitable to Allah جل جلاله ونفخت فيه من روحي and I decree the روح to go into him then O angels أيها الملائكة فقعوا له ساجدين then you make sujood to him what are you making sujood to him as a clay no, 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 no. You're making sujood to him now because there's that ruh that Allah ordered, that soul that Allah ordered to go into that human being. 
if that's the only takrim, well, you are, they used to tell Sayyidina Bilal, radiyallahu ta'ala, no, Bilal al-Habashi, Bilal ibn Rabah, you know, because Bilal was from Africa, and you know, he was a black man. So they used to, some people who still had some, uh, you know, unpolished ideas, they would look at Bilal and say, so, you know, I am from this tribe and this qabila and this qabila. So who is your father? Which is your qabila? Who is your father? And Bilal radiallahu anhu would tell them, I am the son of the one whom Allah made the malaika do sujood to. That's my father. Who's your father now? Huh? My father is the one who the angels made sujood prostration to by the order of Allah. That's who my father is. All right. This takrim, this honoring of the, of the human as a human being, just because the human being, by virtue of being a human being, and Islam emphasized this so much, that's why Al-Quran Karim went to say, مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ مِنْ أَجْلِ ذَلِكَ كَتَبْنَا عَلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ أَنَّهُ مَنْ قَتَلَ Write the ayah, you know it. فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا لَا يَكُوْسُ سَيْهِ وَمَنْ أَحْيَاهَا كَأَنَّمَا أَحْيَا النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا Who kills one nafs. Notice the Quran did not say Muslim. Huh? مَنْ قَتَلَ مُسْلِمًا No, 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 no. مَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا No, 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 I did not say that. The verse in the Quran is very clear. مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا Whoever kills one soul, it doesn't matter what the soul is. As if he killed the entire humanity. And whoever revives one soul and gives life to one soul as if he's given life to humanity. Why do you think Hadith of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam fi Khaybar, Hadith Sahih, when he tells Ali radiallahu anhu, he says, huh? the Hadith came in three different, ver- three different al-fad. Oh, sahiha. He says, If Allah makes like that, if you put, if Allah facilitates you to bring life into a human soul, this is better for you than the whole earth. That's why the Quran Karim insists on that we are brothers with others who are not even Muslims. Huh? I'm not talking about just Muslims, about non Muslims. وَإِلَى ثَمُودَ أَخَاهُمْ هُودًا صالح عفواً. Huh? All right, wait. You have وَإِلَى مَدْيَنْ أَخَاهُمْ شُعَيْبٍ وإلى ثمود أخاهم صالحة وإلى عاد أخاهم هودا الله says to عاد عاد people who did who were not believers they did not believe الله sent them هود عليه السلام but what does Allah call him وإلى عاد أخاهم his their brother we sent to عاد their brother هود we sent to مدين their brother Shu'ayb. Shu'ayb is a Nabi of Allah. But Allah calls him their brother, Akhahum. Ajeeb. Akhahum? Yeah, of course, Akhahum. Isn't he their brother in humanity? Aren't they all the children of Adam? That's why Allah says also, وَإِلَى مَدْيَنَا أَخَاهُمْ شُعَيْبًا قَالَ لَهُمْ أَخُوهُمْ نُوحٌ أَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Quran talks about them. Nuh telling them. Akhuhum, Al Quran calls them their brother. Their brother Nuh told them. But they are not believers. They don't believe in Allah. They don't believe in His messengers. Still, Allah calls them their brother. We need to take ishara from this and understand. That's what Al Qalashandi, rahmatullahi alayh, when he said, Fi ma'alim al khilafa, if my memory serves me best. And he said that also, Fi surah al A'sha. Huh? He said that when Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the fourth righteous Khalifa, when he sent one of the governors, he told him, when you go to this new place that you go to, look and observe one thing that's important. 
An-nasu, people to you are two kinds. Imma akhun laka fi deen either he's your brother in faith or he's your brother in humanity. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Therefore, this is from the Qur'an. Let's go to the Sunnah to see the value of human life. Why did Allah send the messengers? Why did Allah arsal al-rusul wa anzal al-kutub? Why did He send the books? Why did He reveal the revelations on Jesus, Isa, or Musa, Moses, or Ibrahim, Abraham, or Nuh, Noah, or, or, or all of them? Why did He send the messengers for what? For the Anbiya only? What's the maqsad of the risala entirely? You ask all the usulis, the scholars of usul, they'll tell you sa'adatul insaniya. The reason Allah sent the messengers and sent the messages is to bring happiness to humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you messengers so you can be happy. So you can find your ultimate happiness. So you can reach as a human being, you reach your maximum potential as a human being. You move from insani to rabbani. Huh? Not insani to haywani or to worse, shaytani. No, you move from insani to Rabbani. Allah says, Walakin kunu Rabbaniyin. You need to be Rabbanis. In fact, this is Amr, Taqween. Be Rabbani. Al Quran is ordering you not just to be insani in the sense of just you worry about your insaniya, but you have to be a Rabbani. In other words, a godly person. In the sense of what? A spiritual person, that's what it means. A person who's close to God, the Creator, I mean, huh? the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who realizes that the mission in life is that you leave the world that was entrusted to you a better place when you go. And that's why your uswa is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Arabian Peninsula was locked in all these violence and all these wars. People used to kill their own daughters. People used to go like, the law of jungle was in the Arabian Peninsula at that time. The law of jungle. Like I said, might makes right. I don't want you to think that was only back then, 1500 years ago. Lots of people still live under the law of jungle even in their homes. Pharaoh or Pharaoh may have died, but he left lots of mini pharaohs everywhere. Right. Some people are nice outside, but inside their houses they become like Pharaoh. يحضرني يعني في هذه comes to me now that I'm talking about this. الإمام الدميري رحمة الله عليه صاحب حياة الحيوان الشافعي. Let me tell you the story. I don't like to tell stories, you know, but I'll tell you the story. It's okay. هذا الإمام الدميري in his book حياة الحيوان he says this. He says there was three people or three animals: a lion, a hyena, and a fox. A lion, a hyena, and a fox. They went hunting. Taban the lion is the king of the jungle. So they went hunting, they caught a cow, a sheep, and a chicken. After they caught it, the hyena, Ibn Awa, yani, the hyena came to the lion, he says, Your Majesty, huh? Your Majesty, Your Highness, he is the lion. How do you 
suggest we distribute the booty. We have a cow, we have a sheep, we have a chicken. And the lion tells him, why don't you tell me what is fair in your mind? He says, your majesty, it's simple. You take the cow, you're the king. You give the fox, the sheep, and I'm happy with the chicken. And Imam al Damini says that this lion took his hand and put his claw out, claws, and he hit the head of the hyena, separating his head from his neck, and the head was rolling. Killed him right away. Then the lion turned to the fox. He says, my dear fox, how do you suggest we distribute the booties? He says, uh, the fox said, your majesty, it's very easy. For breakfast, you take the cow. For lunch, you take the sheep. And you snack at night on the chicken. Lion said, Ajib, have al faham, this adala, this understanding of justice. Where did you get this understanding of justice from? Where did you learn to be so just? Kayfa ta'allamt had al faham al adil. Where did you learn how to be so just? He says, Allamani ra'su ibn awa. You see the head of the hyena, that's how I learned. <laughs> But if you live like, yeah, this is going with the flow. Like in Islam did not come to ask us to live with the flow. Islam asked us to contribute positively. Not to live like a jungle. Islam did not ask you to give Allah which is what is left. Today people give Allah what's left. And their money, what's left. And their time, what's left. Whatever it is, they give them whatever is left. Allah wants you to give what's right, not what's left. That's why he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will never achieve piety until you spend from that you love most. Quantity and quality. Not just quality, quantity. Why do you think Sayyidina Siddiq radiyallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda awwal al-khulafai al-rashidin wa kabiru al-sahabati wa akbaruhum radiyallahu ta'ala anhum anhum wa afdaluhum Why do you think he became a Siddiq? Because he was talk? Or actions were louder than words? Lan tanan ul-bir Don't think that we can change if we haven't actually transformed our hearts, no way, we're lying to ourselves. Don't think that you can give Allah what's left, left over, and you think we can fool Allah. No, 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 no. No, no, it doesn't work that way. Inna Allah tayyib la yakhwalu illa tayyiba. It's a basic rule, all of you know it. You just, sometimes we just choose not to see it. Going back to the topic, let's see how an Nabi Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam treated the human being as a human being. Al hadith li fi sahih Muslim comes to me always. Not only an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sahaba radiyallahu anhum standing up for the janazah of a Yahudi. Yahudi janazah was coming by. Stood up, Hadith of Sahih Muslim. I'm not talking about a Muslim that you disagree with them, like today. No, no. A Yahudi's janazah was going by funeral, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi wa Sahbihi wa Azwaji wa Sallam stands up. They said, "Qalu ya Rasulullah, hada Yahudi. This is a janazah of a Yahudi." And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Tells them, Alaysat nafsan, isn't this a nafs? Hadith Sahih Muslim. 
the liberation of Mecca, Fatih Mecca, 23 years, 23 years, 13 in Mecca, 10 years in Medina. The people of Mecca did everything to the Prophet Sallallahu They killed his Sahaba, they confiscated the properties of the Muslims in Mecca, they took their money, they tortured them, persecuted, Bilal tortured, persecuted them. They expelled them from Mecca. Sayyidina Sadiq was also expelled, forced out of Mecca. And then also, they, you know what they did to the Prophet Sallallahu continuous attempts on his life until the last day where they went and hired so many, 50 people, 50 young people from 50 different sub-tribes in Quraysh so they can kill the Prophet Sallallahu Continuous daily attempt on his life. Then a Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to Mecca, Medina, Afwan. Went to Medina, it did not stop. Badr, Uhud, Al-Khandaq, Ahzab, all these things. It's led by the Meccans. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam eventually goes to Mecca and those people still holding out. Many of them are criminals. What does he do? Oh, if you see the picture, يعني, according to the authentic riwayat, Tabarani riwayat hasana, to say the least, or some of it are sahiha, where you see how the Muslimin were going into Mecca, liberating Mecca, finally. Thousands of people, brigades, every qabila from the Muslimin, they have their flags, and they're going to Mecca, huh? marching in. Hatta sometimes they, there's the brigade of the a cabal of the Sahaba. Huh? Abu Sufyan was with Al-Abbas and Abdul Muttalib. He sees people coming and they're looking. He says, who are these people? They're with the swords and everything. He says, this is, they call them the Red Death. Al-Mawt Al-Ahmar. Huh? Be, be careful. He comes in, what does he do? What does he do to all these people that held out to the last minute? Go, you are pardoned. He did not come to take life away from people. He came to give them life. He didn't even force them to become Muslims. Those tulaqa, we call them tulaqa. He did not force them to say shahada. Go, you're free. Go. You want to become Muslim, become Muslim. You don't become Go, you're free. Eventually, many of them became Muslims. Many of them. Hadith al-Bukhari Muslim, Imam Muslim narrated it fully, ka'adatih, yani manhaj al-Imam Muslim, he narrates the hadith entirely. Manhaj al-Bukhari rahimahullah, that he sometimes, he takes what he needs out of the hadith. And the manhaj al-Muhadithin. So al-Bukhari narrated it short, mukhtasar, lakin Imam Muslim narrates it entirely. Umawjul al-Hadith. Al-Hadith says that al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or the Muslims went qibala najd. Najd, which is in Eastern Arabia today. Yani the area where Riyadh today is, that's where Najd is. فَأَسَرُوا رَجُلًا مِنْ بَنِي حَنِيفَ A man from Bani Hanifa. Bani Hanifa used to live in Najd. Huh? That's the Qabila of Musaylam al-Kadhab. It has nothing to do with that. Sayyidina al-Imam al-A'zam Abu Hanifa. Sayyidina al-Imam al-A'zam Abu Hanifa is... And his name is Nu'man bin Thabit bin Zuta al-Kufi. Huh? Yeah. These people are called Bani Hanifa. Qabila is a small tribe that lives in Najd. Until today you see Wadi Hanifa. It's known. It's a known place. And so these people were not believers. Oh, they were fierce fighters. And they were used, they're used to know, to be known. Their industry was Sina'atu Suyuf. They used to make swords. That's what they do for life. So if you want to have a good sword, sword, you buy Hanafi sword. Not Hanafi according to the Madhab. <laughs> Hanafi from Bani Hanifa. Yani. Allah help us. <laughs> from them, 
Musaylam al Kadhab was there and the battle with people with them was there, Bani Hanifa. Anyway, the, the, he was this man became a prisoner of war from Bani Hanifa. So he was brought to Medina. His name was Thumama ibn Athan. Thumama. They brought him to the Prophet وسلم, to Medina, that's a long way from his home. What do they do? What, what do you think people do, and Muslims at that time do to the prisoner of war? They feed him from the same food. They take care of him. Like, and they tied him. They tied him up. Where did they tie him up? In the prophetic masjid. Here. We'll tie you up here. You cannot leave the masjid. But you can eat, drink, everything, no problem. But you cannot leave the masjid. But you have to stay in the masjid until the Prophet ﷺ decides what he does with you. So Nabi ﷺ says, Ma ba'luka ya thumama? What is it with you, ya thumama? Thumama looked at the Prophet ﷺ and he told him, Ya Muhammad ﷺ, In taqtul taqtulu dha dam. If you kill me, because that's a prisoner of war and they're killed lots of Muslims. So, you know, nafs for nafs. He says, if, but if you kill me, you'll kill someone whose blood is sacred to his people. My tribe, I am very honorable amongst them. And if you kill me, they're going to come for my blood. Retribution, revenge. And if you, great, if you give me, if you pardon me, then I will not forget this favor of yours. Huh? SubhanAllah. وَإِنْ أَرَدْتَ الْبَالِ If you want money, فَسَلْ مِنْهُمَا شِفْ Put your number down. If you want money, just what is your number? Here's the check. Huh? There was no checks. Yeah. No problem. No, he was honorable amongst his tribe. And Nabi Wasallam left him in the prophetic masjid. He says, you know, basically he left him and that Thumama is watching everything. Now he's in the masjid, nothing is hidden. Prophetic message at that time was small. He's seeing the Sahaba, everything. Next day, you know, you would think that he saw the Sahaba praying. He saw the Sahaba and their dhikr. He saw the Mu'amala, how the Sahaba, the Muslims, the early Muslims were treat, treating each other. If you see these people, you know, your heart, Softens. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa comes next day. Ha, Thumama. He says, Ya Muhammad, in taqtul taqtulu dha dam. If you kill me, you kill someone whose blood is going to bring you revenge. Wa in tun'im tun'im ala shakir. If you pardon me, I will not forget your favor. And if you want money, put down the number you want. This man is a Bedouin. Fierce warrior, he's not gonna let go. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left him. Third day, what is it, Ya Thumama? He says, Ya Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in taqtul, taqtul, same thing. If you kill, you kill someone whose people are gonna come for revenge from you. And if you pardon me, I will not forget your favor. And if you want money, then put down the number you want. Third day, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam looked at him and said, Atliqu thumama, free thumama, go, you're free. Go, you're free. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. He did not come to kill people. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He came to give people life and hope. Subhanallah. Even if they didn't believe. Thumama, after they freed him, he says, Ya Muhammad, he says, Wallah, by Allah, no wajah, no face on the whole earth was more hated to me than your face. And no face on the face of the earth is more beloved to me than your face. No city, no deen was hated for to me in the whole earth than your deen. And no deen is more beloved to me now than your deen. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. 
an Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to teach humanity, not to kill humanity. To bring humanity to its maximum potential. To show us a lesson. Hadith Ahmad wa Isnadu Sahih. Rijadu wa Thiqat an Akhirihim. An Nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ida qamati al qiyama. If the qiyama is called, wa biyadi ahadi kum fasila. And one of you has fasila. Fasila is a small palm tree like this. Huh? You know how big the palm tree is. And it takes a decade, maybe. It takes many years for the palm tree to grow and bring you fruit. Yani dates. But the Nabi says, إِذَا قَامَتِ الْقِيَامَةِ If the Qiyamah is called. Now, the Malaika are calling, time for Qiyamah, report to Ard al-Mahshar. You have to go to the land of resurrection. But you have fasila, you have a small palm tree in your hand. And Nabi says, فَإِنْ يَسْتَطَاعَ If he can, before he answers the call of Qiyamah, to leave this plant, to plant this fasila on, in the soil, then report to Qiyamah. But Ya Rasulullah, it takes the Qiyamah as being called وَإِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا Who everything is going to go and this fasila, this, this little palm tree, it's going to take it 10 years to grow to be a palm tree. Why I have to bother with this? There's no more earth. يَوْمَ تُبَدَّلُ الْأَرْضُ غَيْرُ الْأَرْضُ وَالسَّمَاوَاتِ There's not going to be the same earth. All these things, why am I bothering? It's not your job. Your job is to build, not to destroy. Your job is to plant life, not death. That's what your job is. Violence is evil. Let me finish with this. And evil is as old as humanity. It goes back to Qabil and Habil. Qabil killed Habil, right? Yeah. Qabil, Qaf al Qatil. Adi al Qaf for Qatil. Qabil. Qabil killed Habil, his own brother. Violence. So violence is old. I'm not going to sit here and pretend it's as old as humanity. I'm not going to sit and pretend it doesn't exist. But I will sit and stand up and say that Islam came to declare war on all kinds of violence. Subhanallah, subhanallah. Violence is not native to a faith. Definitely not the Islamic one. It's not consistent with its ethics or values. Violence is the language of the inarticulate. How can it be even related to what Islam teaches? Islam means by definition surrender and peace. It doesn't mean violence. لا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي شوف التفضيل أحسن huh? not just you should the good and the bad are not equal حسنة والسيئة القرآن tells us are not the same if you want to do something ادفع بالتي هي أحسن do that which is better not that which is good which is good is not good enough is what the Quran is telling us if you do just that which is good that's not good enough. You gotta do that which is better, not just good. Good is not just good enough. And that's why I always say, yani, that means if you're good to those who are good to you, then what good are you? Billatihiya Ahsan, Al Quran Kareem says. When we look at violence today, it's deeply rooted 
in a concept I call verbal violence. Physical violence is only a manifestation of verbal violence, of teaching and preaching hate towards others whom we disagree with or people disagree with. Ver violence does not come without verbal violence first. And that's why I always think that verbal violence is much more lethal than violence because that's the premise upon which actual violence takes place. Those who erect walls of hate under the banner of love or those who erect walls of hate and vi verbal violence under the banner of mercy. Those who think that unity must mean conformity versus if we learn anything from the Sahaba, may Allah be well pleased with all of them, as in Bani Qurayla, you know the, the issue. Some of them prayed Asr immediately, some of them delayed Asr till after the Asr time. If we learn from the Sahaba al-Kiram, anything, we learn that we can look at one thing and see it in two different ways. Unity does not mean conformity. That's a cult culture. And we don't run cults. We run a deen. We follow a deen rather than establish cults. It's not about a cult culture. The saved, the saved sect is the one that's trying to help everyone else go to Jannah, not the one that's trying to lock everybody else in Jahannam. The saved is the one that tries to give guidance and hope, not the one that tries to deprive hope from others. I don't, I don't really believe that violence and religion come together in any way because the essence of our religion is peace. But violence has always been associated with religions. In fact, you ask many people nowadays, even taxi drivers, and they tell you that religion is the essence of all war. I look at it from a different point of view. The causes of conflicts are usually greed, ambition, and self-interest. But in order to sanitize, in order to sanitize those self-serving emotions, we cloak them with religious rhetoric. Because religion came to give people hope. If it's for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't disagree. There has not been any time in history, in recent history, I mean, not in history entirely, but in recent history, where the voice, the merciful voice of religion has been so sorely needed. Because when you have preachers and orators and maybe scholars, I don't think scholars would do that, they should not. When they start acting like some sectarian politicians, praising, always singing the praise of their own group and showing scant regard to anyone else that disagrees with them, even little, when they are on their pulpits, rarely speak of unconditional compassion but they make secondary issues and abstruse doctrinal formulations as the true standard of true faith. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a cult culture, not Islamic, prophetic approach. Absolutely. 
when we take people away from the inclusiveness and the unconditional compassion of Islam to the exclusiveness and to the conditional compassion of our own selves and desires and ambitions and aspirations, we're driving people away from Allah because we're calling them to ourselves, not to Allah. That's not the message of the Prophet I always say there is this Let me not say that, it's better. The book and the sunnah are our bases. The book and the sahih of the sunnah of Rasulullah This is the framework. If we put stipulations that are not in the framework, we're adding to the faith. That which is not part of it. But guess what? The book comes from Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. The unconditionally compassionate, the unconditionally merciful. And the sunnah comes from ar rauf Ar-Rahim. The kind unconditionally and the unconditionally merciful. But we are not as Rahim to people. Before we can offer others compassion, we need to internalize compassion and live it ourselves first. Before we tell people Islam is a religion of mercy, which it is, but we have to live mercy and taste it, not just talk about it. I'm not saying that today there is no violence that's done in the name of Islam. But what I'm saying is that Islam is innocent from any violence that's attributed to it. Islam is the deen of Allah that gives all people hope. And Islam is the deen of Allah that gives all people life. It doesn't take their life away. It gives them nur. It doesn't give them darkness. But surely, today with the open sources of information everywhere, people go in every which direction. Because we have changed our deen, or I always like to say we, had, we have dwarfed, yani taqzim, we have dwarfed our deen from a holistic, prophetic approach to rituals, not spiritual. Do, you're good. Spiritual, forget about it. There's no need for spirituality. Today, we say, perfect your salah. And that's good, and we must perfect our salah. How about perfect our mahabba to Allah? No? Oh, that's not important. Just perfect your salah. You think your salah is going to get you to Jannah? You think your siyam is going to get you to Jannah? Even if you perfect it. You think your hajj is going to get you to Jannah? Even if you perfect it. You think all your ibadah will get you to Jannah? Even if you have perfect ibadah. Never. What will get you to Jannah is the mercy of the Creator, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doesn't mean you don't perfect your ibadah. You must perfect your ibadah. But you see, in Islam we learn, and Nabi Akram sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa azwaji wa sahbihi wa sallam taught us that we must perfect our a'mal, our deeds, and once we perfect them, we belittle them and put them behind us. Why? Because it's not the amal that will get me close to Allah. If I see the deeds in front of me as perfect, those very deeds become hijab and a veil, veiling me from being close to Allah. I see that I am doing something. In fact, you need to look at who are you presenting this deed to, not what, how perfect your deed is. If you look at yourself, how perfect your deed is, you might find it very perfect. But when you look at you're presenting this deed to Allah, Rabbul Alameen, then no matter how perfect your deed is, it becomes imperfect. Master your deeds. Forget them. Perfect your deeds, but never rely on them. Because the reliance on the deed is the sign of losing. 
you perfect your deed and rely on Allah. Subhanallah. Not on your deed. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Not on your amal. So today we perfect our madhhab, our zahir, and we perfect our amal. Like and we forgot to perfect the fundamental thing in our faith, which is unconditional rahmah, unconditional compassion. The mercy, the, the message of Rasulullah is all about unconditional compassion. Where is that perfection of that message? The love of Allah. Where is the perfection of the love? Of Allah, يحبهم ويحبونه والذين آمنوا أشد حبا لله. Those who believe Allah tells us the meaning of the ayah have more love for Allah. I'm not talking about lip service. Everybody says they love Allah. Ah, Maulana, leave the lip service alone. Lip service, mashallah, we can all sell. We can sell kalam from here to to, to New York. Kalam is cheap. Talk is cheap. No, no, no. I'm talking about your daily priorities. And where is where is the mahabba of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Subhanallah. It's Subhanallah. not slogans. The mahabba is not slogans. The mahabba is transformation. You become Muhammadi not in your looks, in your heart, Subhanallah. in your soul. Then it reflects on your looks. Then it doesn't matter what you have on your looks. You still look Muhammadi. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. But the problem today, we dwarf our deen into rituals and slogans and you know colors and shi'arat. Uh, you hear about tahin. You hear tahin, wa la tara tahin. You hear something, but there is nothing coming out. Uh, you know, like the car, you turn it on, but you're not moving anywhere. You're spending, uh, you're spending petrol and you're spending battery, but you're not moving. You got the looks, but you don't have the real, the essence. People who go, who are drawn towards violence from the Muslims, obviously that's bad because violence is evil. But that tells you something else. It's not about us condemning violence all the time. We need to condemn violence. But that tells you also that we need to offer alternatives so people don't go to these evil places. You see, when, when the masajid don't offer alternatives, when we as homes, in homes, don't offer spirituality, when we dry our deen and make it only ritual, not spiritual, then people are going to start, these young people are going to start looking for ways out. Because they're not getting it from the masajid, for example. I'm not saying that means the masajid is not giving it. No, no. I'm just saying in extreme examples. Then they're going to look for different sources. And they're going to lose. Because when you commit violence, you lose, the, you lose your dunya and you lose your akhirah as well. You lose in the dunya and you lose in the akhirah, both. Young people need the forgiveness of the religion, the love of the religion, the inclusiveness of the religion, the beauty of the religion, not just the rituals of the religion. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when we talk about violence, or terror. I don't like the word terror. I like it's too painful. Violence, because violence has many, many kinds of things, many different levels in it. Shuf hadith Sayyidah Aisha radiyallahu anha Sadiqa bintu Sadiq na Sahih Imam Muslim. يقول لها النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يا عائشة إن الله يعطي على الرفق ما لا يعطي على العنف. Oh عائشة, Allah rewards on kindness. And he does not reward on violence. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Basic things. Very basic things. And Islam tells you if you take out man ashara bi hadida, hadith al sahih, if you raise a, a little knife just out of playing in the face of your fellow brother, then that is fusuq. Saying a bad word. These are all. That's, that's verbal violence. Hadith Mu'adh, you all know Hadith, hadith Mu'adh. Qala ya Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
أخبرني بما لاك الأمر كله What is the key thing? النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم takes his tongue to God. He says, أمسك عليك هذا. Take care of this. You're going to be okay. Subhanallah. Sayyidina Mu'ad says, يا رسول الله أو مؤاخذون Are we going to be actually responsible for what we say? النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم tells him, ويحك وهل يكب الناس على وجوههم يوم القيامة إلا حصائل ألسنتهم Isn't what makes people being dragged in Jahannam on their faces but the result of their tongues? Is that verbal violence or not? Verbal yes. violence. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is institutionalizing in Islam measures anti-verbal violence. Let alone what? Let alone actual violence. That's why Hadith al-Bukhari is misunderstood in my view anyway. وَنُصِرْتُ بِالرُّعْبِ You've heard the Hadith. Huh? I was given victory by fear. Some people say, look, you know, that's the Prophet ﷺ. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the fear in the hearts of the people. So that's, you know, that's how he overcomes them. I look at it from a different point of view. How? And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah sent him rahmah lil alameen. Subhanallah. Mercy to all people. If these people who who fight him dare and come and fight him, he has to live until the message is completed. They have to die. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet ﷺ this tool of Nusra that he puts fear in the heart of his enemies so they don't come and fight him. Because if they come and fight him, he has to survive. He has a message to deliver. There's no way he will go. They will have to go. So Allah will save him and they will have to go. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because he's Rahman Rahim and this Rasul is Rahman Al-Alameen, he saved even his enemies from fighting him face to face, otherwise they will have to die. So he put fear in their hearts so they wouldn't even come close to him. Subhanallah, subhanallah. That's what Al-Busiri rahimahullah, al-Sha'ir, huh? Sahib al-Burda, yani. Al-Busiri said, in one of the lines, he says, كَأَنَّهُ وَهُوَ فَرْدٌ مِّن جَلَالَتِهِ فِي عَسْكَرٍ حِينَ تَلْقَاهُ وَفِي حَشَمِ He says, when you look at him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even by himself, but from his Jalal, you think he is standing in the middle of a huge army. So you, huh? you say, no, I don't, I, I don't even go. But that's what? That's Madhar min Madhahir Rahman Muhammadiyya. So he doesn't shed the blood of the, of the other people. So he's not the cause of, of their shedding blood. Today, in these circumstances, and I don't want to take too long of a time, let me finish. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked us to practice unconditional compassion. Hadith Muslim, man la yarham la yarham. Wal musalsal bil awaliya, wal musalsal bil rahma. An Abdullah bin Amr bin Aas, al rahimuna yarhamhum al rahman, tabarak wa ta'ala. يرحموا من في الأرض وفي لفظ يرحموا من في الأرض يرحمكم وفي لفظ يرحمكم من في السماء have those who are merciful are eligible for the mercy of Allah you want to get the mercy from Allah you have to start practicing mercy Subhanallah there's no other way there's no other way this violence has nothing to do with Islam that happens in the name of Islam. Just like violence that happens in the name of other faith systems. The faith itself does not tell go kill people. <laughs> we have to be careful from those who actually say, we need to hate, we need to kill, we need, we need, we need, we need. What we need now is to have a peace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within our hearts first. We need to correct ourselves first. We need to have peace with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and stop doing, stop displaying public disobedience with Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and then maybe we should carry out our da'wah work properly, the Muhammadan way. 
sallallahu ala sahibi. He tells us compassion is that we work hard to alleviate the suffering of every human being. That's what compassion is. That's what our rahma is. Rahma is that you work hard, tirelessly, to alleviate the suffering of your fellow creation. That's why the man went to Jannah, because he gave a thirsty dog a drink. It's a creation. They said, Ya Rasulullah, giving a thirsty dog a drink, there is ajr or jannah? He tells them, Fi kulli kabidin ratbat, ratbat. He didn't say only to be good to the Muslim. Fi kulli kabidin. In every living thing that you help, there is a reward. Subhanallah. This is the name of Islam. You here in India, I mean, you know, Sultan al Hind, Sayyidina Mu'in Deen Chishti Rahmatullahi Alayhi Allah, Allah, Allah. What was his message? Hate? Today, some people act as if they are the gate gatekeeper of Jahannam. And there are those they don't like, they just enter them and yell, go, 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 go. And then they close the door and they throw the key in the ocean. Khalas, no, that's it. <laughs> As if Ridwan works for them, Umalik works for them. And, uh, you know, we don't, you know, well, you better worry about your own destiny. Religion cannot be, any religion cannot be forced onto people. Huh? Among the ikram of the Basharia from Allah, Qawluhu Ta'ala la ikrah fi deen. No compulsion in religion. Why? Religion is something right here. You have to be convinced, huh? You have to have tasdeeq in the heart. And nobody knows the heart but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's very important. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then, He gave us this thing, this beautiful faith to bring people, to bring ourselves first before people. Huh? To transform ourselves first, to be Rabbani people, to be Muhammadi people, to be people of unconditional compassion and love. That that salah of yours that you make, the salah and that zakah that you make, that prayers of yours that you make, that brings you closer to Allah. It's not just lip service. No, no, no. Your heart, you are Rabbani. You become close. You are filled with love. You're oozing with love everywhere. You're oozing with rahmah. You're flowing with compassion onto everything around you. Why do you think the hadith al-hakim, musahah al-hakim, rahimahullah, fil mustadrak, when that humurra, when that bird came running to the Prophet sallallahu one bird came running to him, all of a sudden, and she started, the bird started talking to the Prophet Subhanallah. Well, what's going on? And Nabi says, Man uh, Who took the children of this bird amongst you? Hadith Sahih, huh? They said, when I, yeah. He, they said, Ya Rasulullah, I did. One of them said, yeah, I, I took them. He says, return them. Subhanallah. This kind of humanity, how can there be violence? Hadith Hassan to say the least. Where Nabi sallallahu alayhi if you kill a bird, a bird, huh? You kill a bird without an excuse. This bird will come, a little bird, Usfur is a little bird. This bird will come Yawm Al-Qiyamah as your enemy before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A little bird I'm talking about. Not, not talking about other things. In the three, the three fi Sahih al-Bukhari that came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya ahibba wallahi, our deen is a deen of love. It's not a deen of violence. Violence only breeds violence. Violence is not the answer. 
لئن القرآن states that لئن بسطت إليك إلي يدك لتقتلني notice when have when Qabil the Qatil want to kill Habil his brother Habil told him what the meaning of the ayah in the Quran لئن بسطت إلي يدك if you extend your hand to kill me ما أنا بباسط يدي إليك لأقتلك I will not extend my hand to kill you إِنَّ أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ I have the fear of Allah رَبُّ الْعَالَمِينَ In other words, if you want to do wrong, I'm not going to do wrong because two wrongs do not make it right. We don't correct evil with evil. You don't correct violence with violence. You don't correct hate with hate. Hate can never extinguish hate. Love can. Yes. Love can. Yes. Huh? This man comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He holds him from here. He said, Ya Muhammad, Atani, give me. This is the money from Allah, not the money from your father. Like this. And he's holding him like this. Huh? Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, you know his hand is on the trigger. <laughs> Ready. Huh? Ya Rasulullah, let me allow me. Give me permission. Huh? Leave him. Leave him. Give him. Satisfied? He says, more. Give him. Satisfied? More. Give him. Satisfied? No, more. Give him. Give him. He kept giving him until he says, I am satisfied. Subhanallah. Bedouin, he takes all the money, he goes to his tribe in the, in the middle of the desert. He tells them, look, you need to all go believe in this man. Subhanallah. He said what? قَالَ إِنَّهُ يُعْطِي عَطَاءَ مَنْ لَا يَخْشَ الْفَقْرِ This man, he's not for like us. He gives a giving of someone who never fears poverty. You give and you calculate, but he keeps giving, he doesn't fear poverty. Therefore, he's connected to something higher than we are. So go believe in him. Subhanallah. This is the transformation. This is the transformation. Yani hatta he's teaching Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu a lesson. And teaching us a lesson. This is the transformation. Give him, give him, give him so what? Yani who al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if he keeps give, telling you to give, give, you'll give. Even if he, he didn't say stop. Had this man not said, I'm satisfied. And kept saying more and more. Wallahi, he would have gotten more till the end of Qiyamah. No problem. Give more, give him more. More, more. Huh? No problem. Today, my dear beloved brothers and sisters, to make the story short, we need to look at ourselves first. What happens politically and all these things around the world, obviously it brings pain and sadness to our hearts. Because we know that Islam does not call, that does not call, does not call for violence does not adopt violence. Islam is, as a religion is fundamentally anti all kinds of violence. Islam came to give all people hope regardless. To give, gave them all life regardless. We need to do few things. Number one is educate ourselves. And number two, transform ourselves with education. So that Islam that we carry needs to be transforming of us. We need now collective tawbah as an ummah, not just as an individual. Individually, we need tawbah, but repentance. But also as an ummah, we need to go back to Allah. So that there is islah of our hal, so we can change. Allah can change, changes, changes our things. Because if we don't go and do tawbah, it's not going to happen. <coughs> That's one. Number two, we need to educate our youth and bring, restore back the concept of spirituality, which is ihsan, into the teaching. If some people don't like the word tasawwuf, use ihsan. Use ihsan, ya akhi. Ihsan came in the book and the sunnah, no problem. The point is not the word. The point is what's beyond the label. But we need to restore spirituality because that's what it is. The main theme of our faith is how to be a good person. I remember when we were 
in, at the university studying and at, uh, at the feet of our mashayikh rahmatullahi alayhim studying, the first thing they told us, we're not trying to make you a scholar as much as we're trying to make good human beings. <laughs> Scholars, ilm, anybody has. But good human beings, not everybody has. Not everybody can bring. That's why the job of the Anbiya was what? Tarbiyah. Tarbiyah of people. Not just information as knowledge. Today we think the job of the Anbiya was just disseminating knowledge. No, 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 no. Disseminating knowledge or giving information, that's only one part. It was building the human character. Right. Building, and that's the biggest mu'jizah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Among the biggest. Why? Today, it takes you, if you have a son or a daughter, it takes you 20 years to give them tarbiyah. And at the end, sometimes they say, I failed. There's no, there's no adab, there's nothing. And Allah help us. And nowadays, we're, 20 years you're doing tarbiyah and education and putting values and upbringing and everything. After 20 years, huh? uh, last case. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in 23 years, built a generation of people. Tens of thousands of Sahaba. He gave them tarbiyah. Huh? Tens of thousands of Sahaba. He gave them tarbiyah. He made them, yani Sayyidina Umar anhu, from being a giant and, and a big, powerful man in Jahiliyyah, to man when Allah is mentioned and somebody tells him, a woman from the awam tells him, Ittaqillaha ya Umar, fear Allah ya Umar, Umar starts crying. Oh. Tarbiyah, transformation. If nothing else the Prophet Wasallam did, but to transform people, to give them this tarbiyah. And I'm not talking about people who are born in your home and you had 20 years to give them tarbiyah. I'm talking about grown men. He gave tarbiyah to people who are educated and were grown and had upbringing. It's very easy to teach people who are untaught. It's very difficult to tell people, unlearn what you learned and now relearn again. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam still taught a whole generation and they became among the luminaries and the best of generations. That's a marjiza. That's a marjiza. Try to do tarbiyah of one person in 23 years here. Full-time job, do tarbiyah of one person 23 years. Let me see, let's do it. Can you make it like one of the Sahaba? Like even one. That's the alama of Rasulullah He transformed people to be Rabbanis. Today we have that transformation missing because our deen today is not transformation anymore. We made it only information. Learn, khalas. MashaAllah, you are now very good. Huh? Information that doesn't lead to realization and transformation is nothing. Google knows more than you. <laughs> if it's about knowledge, Google knows more than you. When me and all of us combine. Huh? In that sense. We have a responsibility, especially you here in India, because you live in a society that's diverse. You've got lots of different people with you. It's multicultural. To transform yourself and bring back the old ways of the Indian Sufis. Subhanallah. 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 The love that he brought. What was among the main things that Sayyidina Sheikh Mu'in Deen used to say? Love for all, malice towards none. Yes. Come, come, whoever you are, you know, let me give you love. You know, love for all, malice towards none. Unconditional mercy for all, malice towards none. Compassion for all, malice towards none. People today need love. They don't need rituals. Today we don't live in a world of rituals anymore. You have technology and everything. People need true love. They don't need shakil. They need jawhar. They need insight. We need to start internalizing that love. And you know, I believe mercy and violence are opposites. Like Light and darkness. If you turn the light on in a room, darkness runs and escapes.